rephrase things in different ways. And, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> wow. People. Would you like to <laughs> There seem to be a lot of people here. <laughs> Part of the house. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight, and many of you for coming this afternoon and other afternoons and other evenings. This is day eight. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Wow. This is a grand experiment here of what happens when somebody like Barbara Marks Hubbard comes and spends a week. <laughs> and it's been... I would say it's life-changing for me. <laughs> there. <laughs> So, um, I don't know how much of an introduction Barbara needs tonight, because you've been, most of you have been here, well, if you're here, you actually do know why you're here. I need an <laughs> so, I will just then welcome you, those of you who are here for the first time, and feel free to reposition your chairs if you can't see well here. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can in this space that we have. Thank you for your patience and your love. Thank you, thank you. you know, I was thinking, I think that the only co thing I'm concerned about is that everybody can hear. And those back there. Is the music still there? Let's see, excuse me. If those people who are in the back want to come closer up front <coughs> to hear, because it, we don't have a mic and. And we'll get the music off? Can, yes. you, is, can, can you hear my voice? Yes. yes. Okay. So if Roger, that one's free. I mean, Steve. If by any chance you can't hear, it just please. There's nothing worse than a person talks and then after it's all over, someone says, "You know what? I didn't hear a thing you said." <laughs> 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 or the microphone didn't work, but you know we didn't want to bother you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, 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 I just want to say that I have completely fallen in love with Boulder and feel it is my home. Mm -hmm. And that the reason for it is, I guess in my soul, I'm what I would call an evolutionary soul. And it's a particular type that when I was younger, it seemed to me I never met anybody like me. <laughs> and I would be at the Church Women United and the PTA and the General Federation Women's Clubs when I was married with the five children. And there was this thing in me that was always seeing more, wanting more, creating more, but it was called neurotic by Freud, Freud Freudian analysis. So then I finally discovered it wasn't, I won't go the whole story, but I discovered it was that the impulse of evolution is incarnating in me. And I shifted my identity from a frustrated housewife to the universe in person. <laughs> and I realized we're all the universe in person. And whatever is motivating the entire process of creation is that impulse in each of us. And when it turns on in you, it has a genius code for you personally and it's going to activate you or you're going to be miserable. <laughs> because, <laughs> do you know anything about that? <laughs> Not the miserable part, but the activated part, yes. <laughs> Maybe it's because you knew what to do. Yes. Oh, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, many, many things, but... Uh, when you first felt it, what oh. did you do? Well, I found something worth doing and gave myself to it. That, that's it? Yeah. But what was it, I mean? Well, that, what that was was when I ran into um, S back in, S. took the S train back yeah. in 72. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So everybody here has the impulse in them. And everybody I've met is responding in their own unique way to that impulse. And the nature of the impulse is it yearns to co-create. Mm -hmm. It yearns to participate. It yearns to share its gifts. It yearns to give itself fully. And if you're with people for whom that is not what they want, then you're really sort of a pent up. 
would be a word. Because <laughs> you can't get pent it up. Pent, pent up. up. You're pent up. That's a very interesting phrase. But you're pent up because the energy in you doesn't come out the whole way. And so while I was here for this eight days, I've never had such an eight days, and I'm calling it a rolling house party. <laughs> because everyone I met, it, it, we'd say, this is really a great meeting, let's take a walk. Well, then we'll meet later on because we want to do this or that or the other. And after a while, it just became um, th the most joyful experience because actually joining to co-create with others is for me the greatest source of joy there is. Mm -hmm. And the welcoming that, that Glenn and Marion organized here and that they supported me in doing this and Sina was so mm -hmm. gracious in so many ways and the City Club is designed for this mm -hmm. and the origination of the Highland Institute which as I'm learning from Sina and from Mary and Glenn and Ro is Roger here, Roger Bray? Oh, good. Is, is that the, the City Club is giving birth to a new insti institute that really hasn't yet found its full identity, but this is a first for the institute. So it was different than being just invited to come and give a talk or you would meet people. It was invited to help at the beginning of something that could be very, very meaningful. And then when Sina said to me the other night, he said, you know that we have had Athens and we've had Washington and we've had the origin of physics and the origin of democracy and the origin of modern art, but now Boulder is the focus point of history. And what is it the focus point of? in history? Well, that is a really good question because it feels to me it's a focus point of the evolutionary potential being actualized through co-creation. Every single person I met has an impulse to be more creative and to give their gift toward the creation of a new culture, a new society, a new world. And somehow we're all attracted and all found a way to, to participate, to give our gift. So with that, I just want to say thank you, Boulder. Mm -hmm. If Frank Sinatra was here, he would say, <laughs> I love Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think what would be fun to do just to start is to ask Roger Briggs that I just really met, but feels like he's been working on the same path all his life and who is going to be sort of anchoring the Highland Institute to say some words, Roger, about what you think has been happening and what you, your dream is for this. And then we'll go around other people sharing, what would we like this to be? What wants to come into form here? Well, <coughs> thank you, Barbara. <laughs> um, <coughs> I guess I have felt an inner urge for a long, long time and a concern about history and humanity and the way things are unfolding. And I think all of us here know what I'm talking about. I'm a child of the 60s and the counterculture and all that, and that's really what that was about, is we realized that our parents' dream really couldn't go on, that great post-war you know, reward for the having fought the war and the depression. We couldn't, we really couldn't buy into that. And, you know, we, way back in the 60s, we, we could see what was wrong with everything, and we tore everything down. And, but we weren't old enough to figure out what was right and what we need to build. And so now I think we're building that. And I think that's, I view my lifetime as trying to have that culminate in some way so that we can hand off some kind of a new world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think all of you understand what I mean. So, um, you know, I've been called in many ways to be involved with this, and um, this idea of the Highland Institute came up in about June. Uh, it's been an idea in Sina's mind for at least 10 years, but Sina kind of brought some people together, Marion and Glenn in particular, and some others, and somehow I fell into that group, and it all just kind of resonated, and it felt like this is the right path, and I just kept saying, yes, mm -hmm. let's do this, and... Um, one of the ideas was that this would be a place where we could uh, bring, bring things together in sort of a container, an alchemy, 
Kevin likes to talk about alchemy a lot, the magic of putting things in this bowl. And, and um, this idea of having Barbara here, you know, through Glenn and Marion, was just exactly that, is let's see what would happen if we just bring Barbara here and bring people here and put them together and stir, and, and it's been amazing. And I think it, we have actually birthed some, some new things have come out of this, and maybe we'll I share some of that. I think we baked a new pie of so, some sort. <laughs> I want to say something that happened between me and Roger and see if anybody else is interested in this idea. I've been really a f fundamentally an evolutionary educator in everything I've done, whether it's been in politics or speaking or teaching. And like so many of us, I've gathered tremendous amount of material of my own material, of the teachers that I've learned from, of the mm -hmm. colleagues I know. And when I go back to Santa Barbara, there's this huge library of evolutionary thought, but very discoordinated. And I said to Roger, after reading the uh, Journey to Civilization and the desire to educate people around the meaning of, of, edu of, uh, of evolution from a scientific perspective, as well as from a social and spiritual perspective, I said, Roger, how would it be if we had a context for evolutionary education? And different people would put their gifts in it, but you would try to have some sy systemic perspective on it so that if people get excited about these ideas, this would have a place for people to go and express and learn and give their gift. And maybe we could, one of the functions might be evolutionary education coming into new form because almost everybody I talk to is filled with information, but it's still scattered, so I don't know how if the, anybody thinks that's a good idea. <laughs> well, I was an educator for my career, <laughs> and um, in the public schools, which is a fairly limited container, but yet you can do tremendous things. But now, my sense is that we've got to take this out to the world somehow. We can have the little pockets like Boulder, and there's amazing things going on in little pockets all over the place, and, but I'm not sure how much it's really going out into the world and how much we can really capture the scientific community, for example, and the academic community is one of my concerns. Um, but I think this is Maybe what you're Maybe by, by creating a context and having people come in who are evolutionaries within the academic community, yeah. within the scientific, because they're isolated yeah. too. Yeah. You see, uh, within those big communities. Brian well, th those are our, like the, our guidelines, but then the people who are sort of closet evolutionaries. We <laughs> 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 smoke them out, <laughs> and then yeah. it'll happen to them like it happened to me. They'll say, oh my God, this is wonderful. I don't want to leave here. So it will be a genius of genius. A scene <laughs> of genius is what really causes the things to, to move the next level. We have to be with each other. And along those lines, I want to introduce, I think one of our main outreach gifts is Steve Farrell. Steve Farrell has created Humanities Team, uh, founded by Neil Donald Walsh, and he has initiated a program of a global oneness and using the wheel of co-creation as the 12 spheres of life you want to tell about that and how that might fit into an educational idea? Absolutely. And just tell about a yeah. little bit about what you've done. Yeah, well, um, gosh, where do we start here? Humanities Team, Global Oneness Day, and Oneness in 12 Spheres of Life. Well, let me first say, gosh, I see you know some old friends and then new friends here. And what a, what a terrific opportunity this is. It's kind of an intimate setting where we can all just get together and talk about what we can build here in Boulder. I mean, it's exciting. Um, well, oneness in the 12 spheres of life, there's a, a Global Oneness Day is on United Nations Day, October 24th. Um, how many of you have heard of Global Oneness Day? Fantastic. Uh, and we have speakers for Global Oneness Day in the room. Joan Borisenko is on the health panel this year. Uh, and um, gosh, we have Gene Houston on that panel. The CEO mm -hmm. of HeartMath is on that panel with Joan. Bernard Leotar. Bernard Leah, and then uh, Gordon is on the... In every sector of the wheel has an evolutionary. Right. In fact, there's a, there's a Oneness in 12 Spheres of Life panel that Barbara will lead. 
So we'll come right into the discussion of this room because the Highlands Institute, as I understand it, is really it's about giving birth to the wheel, right? We're, we're in humanities team, we're calling it oneness in the 12 spheres of life. Um, Neil Donald Walsh was our founder, so oneness. Uh, Barbara talks about we're all a, a face of the universe. I'll use the word God since Neil Donald Walsh is our founder. We're all, you know, we're all a face of the divine, right? Uh, and that's where humanity's team is coming from. There's one presence which science tells us is true, and we're all a face of, of that one presence of the divine. So uh, Barbara will lead this oneness and 12 spheres of life panel, and, and it talks about tangibly, it's we're going down into the wheel. So we're talking about like in education, which Barbara talked about earlier, what this new meme looks like. Uh, there was a meeting on Friday here, we were talking about a lot of excitement about education because there's so much more we can do with education, where we come from this place of oneness. Uh, but also true for all of the spheres. Governance, uh, you know, imagine what we can do in governance. Wow. Where we're coming Everything. from this place of we are all one, you know. I'm a part of you and you're a part of me. Uh, in each of these spheres, infrastructure and so on. So Barbara is leading this panel, Juan Carlos, who's gonna be in Monterey, Mexico with Barbara. Well, in Monterey, uh, Mexico, they're doing a large-scale wheel with uh, people from Mo Monterey, and they're going to have 12 universities, mm -hmm. each identifying ideal conditions for every sector of the wheel. What's the ideal mm -hmm. condition for health, for education, for economics? And then they're going to have identification of projects that move in the direction of the ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to invite students to come in, and so it will be several weeks of effort with some of their leading business people. And I have to go down there and talk to uh, persuade like people like uh, the head of Pepsi Cola in Mexico that he needs the wheel of co-creation. So that's where some skill has to be. <laughs> Have people feel this is not revolutionary? This is evolutionary. And that's a city where there's a tremendous amount of drug problems. It's dangerous. I didn't realize how dangerous Monterey is, one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also the most yearning mm -hmm. for something. So it's a real opportunity there. And then it's going to be shown on Global Oneness Day. But you should tell a little bit more about all, what, what that Global Oneness Day might be in terms of education that's being initiated here as people get interested in filling out more of those sectors. Yes, uh, and in fact you were sharing earlier that you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could take this all over the world. This is what Global Oneness Day, this is its vision, is that we, you know, we call it the Earth Day for an awakened humanity. Uh, it started in 2010, uh, that was the first day Barbara was a part of the program in 2010. This is the fifth year. Uh, we had over 40,000 last year participate. We're looking for over 50 to 100,000 participate this year. And it's virtual, so people all over the world are participating. Coming from this place of divinity and life. I mean, isn't that me? That many people all connected <laughs> on one day. Coming from this place of, yes, each face, you know, and not only of, of uh, humanity, but plant life and animal life, too. You know, it's all a face of divinity. So it is, it, it's happening all over the world and the objective of Global Oneness Day is to, just like Earth Day, you know, take us into this place to where we can in the Safeway parking lot say, of course, you know, we, we're, you're a face of divinity as I am and have a conversation that's tangible that, that connects with that. Um, by the way, Gordon is on the Spirituality and uh, Global Oneness panel and Patricia Cody Robles is on that panel. Um, Adon Miguel Ruiz may be on that panel. Uh, so, and of course, Barbara leads a panel, so we're right in this room. <laughs> We've got We've three got of the panels. panels. And if I may interrupt you for just a moment, we build tonight as a salon with Barbara and friends. And she has many more friends than she knew before she came here. So all of you are in that category. And I'd like to invite Joan and Gordon to please come here and sit. We are going to give you our chairs because you belong up here. <laughs> And Gordon is also really involved in education as well as all the others. So maybe you'd like to share how that impulse is moving through you. <clears throat> well, I am, um, what I've long been involved in and dedicated to is what I call the humanization of education. And uh, uh, 
Roger, I'm not, I'm not sure of your background, but you said in public education. Um, so a number of years ago, actually in about year 2000, uh, I was invited by Ken Wilbur to be part of the founding of the Integral Institute, and particularly the edu integral education part of that. Uh, the, um, what had concerned me for a long time was that, that we still conduct education, I'm talking about K-12 education, based on 18th century uh, John Locke's tabula rasa psychology, that basically a child is a blank slate to be programmed. And that has created a, a, what we call our production model delivery systems where a, a child is there to basically be programmed and then tested with high stakes tests on the other side. And it's largely driven, has been driven by uh, um, commercial requirements, uh, the, the economic requirements for, you know, what are the skills necessary, saleable to make the use competitive or um, uh, back when there was the nation at risk study, it was like, uh, were our, were our children an adequate arsenal to defend us against the Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. but, um, but a more contemplative understanding of, of a young child. Um, uh, I like Robert Keegan in The Evolving Self who says, organisms organize, and what human organisms organize is meaning. So a child is not a blank slate. A child is a soul organizing meaning about who they are and what they're related to, about identity and relationship, and in particularly relationship to other people and to transcendent meaning and purpose. Um, now, a difficulty is that because children are not met person to person, mm -hmm or as Parker, Parker Palmer would say, on a soul-to-soul -soul basis rather than a role-to-role -role basis. You know, teacher to student versus soul-to-soul -soul, with presence, with warmth, with heart, with emotional range. Um, the result is a, an extraordinary alienation of our student population. In uh, the year 2003, the Commission on Children at Risk published a study called hardwired to connect. And what they said was children, and these were the premier educators, educational psychologists from our top academic institutions, using data um, um, on a large scale. And what they said was um, children are born hardwired to connect, to connect to other people, to connect to their own deep selves, to connect to nature, to connect to transcendent meaning and purpose. But because that need is not met in our schooling institutions, that 21%, this was in 2003, so I imagine the numbers are greater, 21% are considered mentally ill, addicted to substance, or in most cases, both, and that 25%, um, one out of four, would not achieve productive adulthood. Okay, so if we're talking about evolution, uh, especially conscious evolution, and, and being agents who are here to actually, because evolution no longer is what happens to us, it's what happens through us. And uh, how does that happen when um, our development is not really met? So I think that the real key in education is to shift it at the level of purpose from skill development, which is necessary, but that's still a somewhat mechanistic concept, from skill development to human development. And development, um, interesting word, um, uh, my field has been organization development. Uh, some years ago I looked up the meanings of it. First, I, I remember in those days, I went to the University of Colorado Library when they still had card catalogs. <laughs> and uh, there, uh, there were something like eight or 900 entries under economic development, real estate development. 
And then <coughs> there were about 30 entries under early childhood development, cognitive development. So I checked with the, old, the Oxford English Dictionary, and it gives you kind of a historical sequence. The original meaning of development is to unfold from within. Mm -hmm. But by the time we reached the Industrial Revolution, the meaning changed, and this is a quote, to exploit from without. Wow. So, um, uh, so when I'm talking about human development as, as the purpose of education, which is a very complex purpose, it, it means um, not trying to shape from without, not trying to mold, but to create the context for, for the gift, the potential of each human being to emerge and find, find its expression, and, and especially to find expression where the need is most important in the world. You know? so, um, so what I, I, I'm just gonna shorten this a little, a little bit, but uh, um, the person I met at Ken Wilbur's that most interested me was a woman named Rachel Kessler. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel had just published a book called The Soul of Education, yeah. and um, which really dealt with what was really being most deeply unmet in our kids. Mm -hmm. And this went beyond social and emotional learning to continue to deal with the spiritual lives of kids. Um, and she was very successful um, by approaching everybody. You know, it, it looked like a hot potato. This is like religion and, and, and politics, you know, separation of uh, church and state. But that was confusing religion with soul, with spirit. And uh, so Rachel went from everybody from the most hardened uh, atheists to uh, went up to see James Dobson with Focus on the Family. And all, and all of these people, she said, do you see a difference between really nourishing the souls of kids and religion in the schools? And they said, absolutely, we have to nourish their souls. And so uh, that book was published by the uh, uh, AC, ASTD, the uh, Association for, what is it? Uh, American Society of Training and Development. Development. <laughs> Senior moment here, thank you. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, that, we formed the Passage Works Institute, which continues to this day. And um, uh, last year published a wonderful field book called The Five Dimensions of Engaged Teaching. Um, so you think of engaged teaching versus that um, hardwired to connect study of alienated kids and, a, and a, an extraordinary reject rate of 25% of our children. I mean, think if that was a drug company or any commercial venture with a 25% reject rate, but that still doesn't capture enough. You know, how are we equipping young people to really create the future? And especially the very difficult future that we're handing off to them. Um, well, I think that we need more than what has really uh, stood as well, I suppose, since, since the scientific revolution, since the 18th century, and that has been just a, a, a reliance on reason and reason alone. Um, and by reason, I mean discursive, mathematical, logical reasoning. Uh, yeah, actually, for somebody like Plato, re reason was our ability to recognize the good. So um, let me just wind this, this up. Uh, so there are qualities like social and emotional learning that I think are important. There is mindfulness, which is a way of knowing that our schools have not really addressed but is, is, is terribly important. And, and there's something that I'm very wedded to, and that's imagination. And that, that needs to be an absolutely critical part of education, nourishing imagination. And uh, imagination is something I could go on for a very long time ago, but, but it's mainly our ability, and it's really a cosmic ability, to, um, to melt um, the, um, the, uh, what, what uh, our friend Carter Phipps calls the spell of seeming solidity. Mm -hmm. Because what reason does is it solidifies, it reifies the world into this is what is. Mm -hmm. And we fa fail to see that it's in fact 
capable of morphing just as we are, and that we're in a capable of entering a kind of creative dream time where we can actually create. And, um, and imagination, I, I like, especially as it's defined by the 12th century mystic Ibn Arabi, as the creativity of the heart. Himma, the creativity of the heart. So the question is, how do we get these qualities of education, these capacities, really? And, and th that is a huge subject of institutional change, which I, I won't <laughs> at this point. So. Another time, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> well, that's really quite major <laughs> offering. <laughs> You know, I mean, to really uh, work with that. To, mm. Let's see what people, how we want to respond to that. Hmm. Well, if we want to talk about the public schools, and that's the reality of the major, what the education system is, I just offer this slightly different perspective, and that the reality is that there are insurmountable obstacles to, to be working in the public schools, 150 kids a day, every day, no support, constantly increasing demands. And if you want to change that much, you get into the arithmetic of the dollars and it's massive. So given that reality, it seems pretty dismal to do anything like what you're talking about. But the good news is in every school, there are amazing people. And there's a, I'm going to say 10%, if you look at the teaching population, I think it's a bell curve. The other 10% at the other end is scary, but the 10% the that are really performing are doing that. They're teaching soul to soul. They are connecting with those kids. The kids leave their class feeling better than they came in, and they really are learning. And they're just miracle workers. And the answer is, how do we duplicate that? How do we, how do we spread that? And then you get into the union structure of the public schools that says, you cannot even say the word performance. And so we can't talk about good teaching. It is forbidden. And so that's the big obstacle. But I, I think there is good news in that there are people thriving and there's kids thriving in that environment. Not enough, absolutely. But it's there. So that's just. You know, one of the things that, that I, I think will help create the emerging culture is by identifying, communicating where it is working. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because to yes. actually see the models, right. Right. Yeah. even if it's only 10%, there's an attractor factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you can see it and promote it, and I think that's one of the things that we should be, we should be considering and exactly bring that con those kind of teachers in. And I just talked to Cena today, and he wants to have a big global media here and set it up so that what happens here goes out on internet mm -hmm. and, I, and goes out coherently. So I would just offer, in terms of what this group could do, mm -hmm. is as ideas like this come in, to, to start amplifying it out, seeing who wants to respond, and creating the clusters that co-create this. So I'm hoping that Highland Institute might serve this kind of purpose. So you're not trying to brave the huge system, but collecting that which is working and amplifying. That's one thing we could do. Anybody else like to respond to that? Yeah. Two people here. Um, two things. One is I really love what you're talking about in Rachel's work, and it, a lot of it has to do with attachment and our early experiences with love and how we learn to love. And part of those systems is that we're be, that we're held, seen, and soothed, you know, as a child, as as in our mm -hmm. early years. And and if we can do that within an educational environment, it's also very helpful that a child is seen, soothed. And, and, and given also the freedom to be themselves. But, um, and so what my response to that is, when you said internet, is I, that's totally the way the world is going, the global network, the global nervous system, I agree. And if through that education you can encourage people to be close to each other in, in flesh to flesh, hello, how are you, Hola. kind of <laughs> moments. The beautiful thing that you've done with, with Barbara in this week is that these small groups, we, we get to see each other, hear each other, feel each other, smell each other. <laughs> you know, 
but it's it's this human cell to cell biological yeah. resonance that's mm -hmm. so important. Mm -hmm. Cell soul to soul, cell to cell. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. And so if and I and so I'm just cautioning is one of my big pet peeves, I guess, with social media is you know so called friends. You can have a bazillion of them, but who's going to hug you when somebody passes in your life, or who's going to be there to make a meal for you when you're exhausted or or have you know need support? And if we can create more and encourage more of those interactions through the electronic media, that would be my request. Nice. Did you want to? Yeah, this is just going back. To the, I just wanted to make a point on the education <coughs> thing. And so first, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate hearing from you. Mm Hi. -hmm. I was a college teacher for a lot of years and um, in the sciences and actually did write one non-technical book chapter called Too Smart for School and about my own experiences with my son and the point I want to make is that our, those that 25% that we're losing a lot of those are the ones a lot of those are your evolutionaries. A lot of those are the ones who could yeah. do the most good and who yeah. are really the most lost when they come out of the school system. They they don't have any. They they just don't have anywhere to go. And and our school system, that those those most sensitive, most amazing kids often just are completely lost in there and just aren't taught at all. They they just. They're, they need a different structure. And um, anyway, I just, I found that to be one of our greatest failings is like the people who could meet, who could help us the most beyond the super strong Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, there's thousands others that maybe don't have that will, but um, have incredible contributions that our school system just loses, leaves behind. And so, Anything I, you know, I would do anything to help that. Yeah, <laughs> right. I really would. Because Thank you. <laughs> it's been one of the great, and I've seen lots of other, I mean, I've known a lot of that community because I was in touch with them as a mother, and um, mm -hmm. how many of them felt just lost as parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would just say that 10% is critical mass. Mm -hmm. So that's very good news. If it's 10%, then it's already in a good place to expand. Yeah. And the really good news is that it's possible. Yeah. That people can do an outstanding job in that environment. Yeah. So it's got to be, we've got to be able to duplicate that and expand it. So. You know, one of the things this brings up is how it's the mo almost all existing systems are failing whether it be liberal democracy or the educational system or the financial structures and so there's one thing where you go at the system itself and try to change it the other is you create the better models and get them out and I think for people like ourselves that the more we can create the models that work identify them and communicate them and nurture them there's a hope that evolution has a tendency to go for what works but it, it, that our job is to identify what works, bring it out, amplify, communicate, nurture, learn, and attract. Evolution by attraction. Because we're good at that. Anybody, yeah, anybody else want to see what to do about that? There's somebody back here, yes. Thank you. I just, you know, it brings to mind the um, resistance to change that happens globally and I am not one of those. I am a former lost child and have recaptured my own spirit and soul and now I teach in that manner and I see it out there where people, where will they do their own work to um, meet the resistance that is that inertia that does happen and on that cellular so to speak cosmic level to bring awareness to that ego peace is just an idea that I just thought of. Thank you. Well, maybe you could speak to it. To bring awareness to the ego piece, did you say? Yeah, the, the, resi the resistance to change. The resistance to change, yes. Well, you know, if you, the thing about evolution is really amazing. There have been five mass extinctions <laughs> before we got here. And it seems that when things really don't work, 
nature wipes it out. And the very interesting thing is that things really don't work now in so many areas, including the climate change and all of that. And you can feel the pressure for devolution accelerating. Now this is nature's way of causing evolution. Mm -hmm. Failure mm -hmm. and, and crisis is what we're getting. So that's motivating more of us to move forward. So one of the things is to notice where the crisis is and any, any areas where the response is positive, and that's where I love the wheel of co-creation, start identifying and communicating where it's working as a whole system. That's what um, Steve is doing in the uh, 12 spheres of life activity. And it'd be interesting to see if by one of the things that can be done in a group like this is really seeking out where it's working in every system that's breaking down and start connecting and communicating where it's emergent. That we can do. That's what you're doing with all these key, key people. But then the interactions among that, because we're all organs in a new social body, because otherwise you get to feel impotent. You know? When you're up against these big systems, you really can't do it. It has to be this, and I don't know how you all feel about that, but that we, we have enormous freedom to connect that which is creative. That's where we have, people like us, ha we're not gonna be very massive uh, uh, builders of uh, attacking the old structures, but we can, can do that, and I'm always struck by how free we are to co-create if we say yes to our own impulse and join. Yes? Joan? Do you yes. think so? I think so. You're a biologist? I do. What do you think? I do. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something that has nothing to do with biology. But Gordon, and by the way, he has an almost unpronounceable last name, but I thought you might like to know it. Yes. His last name is Deverin, um, D-V-E-I-R-I-N. And we happen to be married. <laughs> uh, but in any case, Barbara, Gordy and I wrote a couple of books together. And one of them <clears throat> is called Your Soul's Compass. And the subtitle of that book is What is Spiritual Guidance? And by guidance, we're really talking about evolution. What is it that motivates us to do what it is that we're all trying to do? So we interviewed 27 spiritual sages. We tried to get a man and a woman from as many different traditions, wisdom traditions, as we could. And one of them, Swami Adaswarananda, actually we had three elders, Swami Adaswarananda, Reb Zalman, and Father Thomas Keating. And of those, only Father Thomas is left. Mm -hmm. uh, it was wonderful mm -hmm. to, get, to get their perspective. And Gordon created 12 questions to ask them about how it is that we actually evolve, how it is that we co-create. And one of them, Swami Adaswarananda, said, you never co-create by changing an old system because there's too much resistance to it. Um, you co-create when something happens where there's a little crack and the light shines through yes. and then you're naturally drawn to the light that shines through yeah. and then you don't have to fight with the old system. It's just that the new one is so much more delicious <laughs> that there's no draw um, to what was less delicious. So <laughs> that, that is the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And on that it's note, to, to what you were saying about imagination, mm -hmm. a vision is required for people to move toward. Like, why do you want to change if you don't have a place to go that's compelling? And finding what's working yes, helps to build, build a does. vision for people to move toward. Ab absolutely. <clears throat> you know, another way of talking about imagination is perceiving the possibility, mm -hmm. the ability to perceive potential. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so true, and I'd just like to say a word on behalf of the, the evolutionary vision if you don't have an evolutionary perspective, it's hard to have much of a collective vision anymore. Because you have to see how nature is constantly breaking down and creating more complex whole systems for billions of years. So that when we see the whole set of breakdowns, 
we have to say, what would the next stage of evolution be like mm -hmm. in order to have a vision? Now, that isn't so easy, because it's not easy to see the radically new. Right. And evolution produces mm -hmm. newness. But I'll tell you where I got my hint, and we'll try it out on people. I really got it from Teilhard de Chardin. Mm -hmm. And he, in his famous book, The Human Phenomenon, pointed out basically God in evolution. And he, he manifested the discussion of the law of complexity consciousness. And if you look at that spiral of evolution from origin of the universe, earth, life, and so forth, all the way on up, as systems become more complex, they jump in consciousness, freedom, and interiority or love, connectivity. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is a, well, that's a 14 billion year trend. Mm -hmm. Every time there's a set of breakdowns and uh, things not working, there's a jump in consciousness, freedom, and more complex order. Mm -hmm. So there would be an innate <coughs> value system to look at for vision. So then the thing would be to say, let's say we envision a society where this complexity is actually leading to more synergistic consciousness and love and order, and then imagine that society because it's going in the direction of evolution. So instead of being told that's idealistic, I used to be called idealistic, and I said, <laughs> I said, do you think evolution is idealistic? Was it idealistic to get from no thing at all to everything that is? <laughs> what, whose idea was that? <laughs> and it certainly was a good idea, if you want to call it that. But the point is, how would we s share a vision if we take the, um, the, 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 the sort of the design of evolution as seen by Teilhard? And for him, it was that the noosphere, the thinking layer of Earth, the global media now, would get connected to the point where we would have a mass lift of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And not just one by one by one after a while, but that the whole field would, would shift. And when that would happen, he was Catholic, he called it the Christification of the Earth. It's when that mm -hmm. feeling of oneness, wholeness, goodness becomes a critical mass. And it doesn't happen one by one, but it's one by one to begin with. So let's discuss whether the vision of a future at the next stage of evolution is being harbored in our hearts here. Because if we need a vision, it's going to have to be out of these crises comes... And it has to be a positive vision. And so a positive vision, right? Moving towards something rather than yeah. moving away or against it. And how to articulate that. Mm -hmm. Apologize. Can I bring in your meme project? Because yes. I think it, you know, we were talking a little bit about this Friday. Uh, one of the things Barbara launched is uh, for each of the 12 sectors or spheres, uh, a project where we're distilling down to a few pages, four or five pages, what the old meme is, how it works today in each of these spheres, and what the new meme is. So we were talking about education on Friday. Um, and when you bring the clarity of the new meme and sit it side by side, the old meme, all in a, you know, and, and it's actually distilled down to you can do a page by page, side by side. You can get this on internet, people can look at what you've done. Yeah, and this is, Barbara again launched this, she launched it through your Generation One class, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Lori Highland, I think, is one of the leaders of that, also mm -hmm. based here in Boulder. Um, when you, just for education, look at this new meme, you go, why are we not doing this, right? Uh, a lot of people that have background in education uh, contributed to this new meme, and where it's talking about the quantum economy and, and uh, uh, the synergy that happens, the synchronicities that naturally happen where people come together. It's so incredibly powerful. And then this leads into what Joan's talking about, uh, where, and then if you can build the model you know, in the attractor aspect of the new model, which seems like what the Highland Institute is talking about here, right in Boulder, so. building the new model here. So first, just getting the vision down on paper so it's really succinct and clear and powerful, and then building it, and maybe starting with education. Well, um, we could take every sector of the wheel, mm -hmm. and people who are interested in the various sectors would build their sectors, and every sector is part of a whole organism, so then you would interact and look for common goals 
and match needs with resources because following Teilhard and uh, Ilya Prigogin and all the chaos theory, the way nature takes jumps is through greater synergy. Social synergy is almost always the key to the jump. Mm -hmm. Self synergy, social synergy, spiritual synergy. So I think the Highland Institute is really set up to do that. Maybe that's why when Sina said a focal point of history, we have a chance to do it here. The old meme is all Newtonian. You know, it's all taking everything apart. It's separating everything. Mm -hmm. Us as machine, you know, this, you're over here and I'm over here. And, mm -hmm. and then this, these new memes are all bringing it back together. It's the whole integration, the unity, the wholeness. Uh, there's, it's so appealing to see these things side by side. You look at it and you go, why are we not doing this? You know? Well, then also the word of, of the artist. Is, is Tony here? But I don't think so. I had a, a conversation. What's Tony's last name? He's the, he's, he does the symphony. Tony. Tony's in town. Is Tony here in the room? No, he left. No. Well, the, um, I did a talk at Unity Church, and I was very inspired by Michael Fitzpatrick, who played the cello. You know, he's really a magnificent musician. And he, I was so inspired that I got up, and the very first sentence I said is that we're on the threshold of a planetary Pentecost. Yeah. Now, I never start a speech on the theme of the planetary pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Michael's music. Yeah. It, he was so reverent. It was reverentially magnificent. And I, I described how I could see, you know, everybody gets spirit from within and they heal and all the good things. And then Bucky Fuller's scenario, the world worked for all. So I just went through a series of what it would be like if it worked, all the way through. So Tony, today, today I was just meeting him, and he came up to me and said, the planetary Pentecost, that could be a symphony. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I love the idea of the planetary Pentecost. And I said, yes. You know, you can't give a speech on the planetary Pentecost. Mm -hmm. What would it sound like yeah. for everybody's voice to be coming from within, mm -hmm. in their own image, in their own words? You see, as, as the, at the first Pentecost, if that would started the whole Catholic religion, just very briefly, what happened, if you don't happen to have read the Bible recently, is <laughs> the disciples, af after the uh, crucifixion and death and resurrection of Jesus, were very frightened because they could be destroyed when they got together. So they met in, in the so-called upper room, and there were people from different nations there, and the disciples got up and spoke, and they say that fire started to come down upon their heads, and they spoke in tongues. They spoke from the spirit within them without thinking, and somebody said, how is it possible they are Galileans and we're all hearing them in our own language? and they must be drunk. Now that was really funny, because that means they, they drank a lot. Because Peter got up and said, we can't be drunk, it's nine in the morning. So that was just a little sign about what, they were, what their lifestyle was. But since it was nine in the morning, they weren't drunk, and P uh, uh, Peter said, this is what has been prophesied by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, the Lord will pour spirit on all flesh, and your young men will see dreams, and your old men will see visions, and your young women will do this and that. And he said, this is the prophecy of that. Mm -hmm. And so they went, they left that room, those disciples left that room with the powers of a natural Christ. Mm -hmm. they, they were frightened before this. And when they left there, they could heal. They could break the bonds of prison. The stories are magnificent. And they started the entire religion which eventually took over the world and got stuck in the power structure. But regardless of that, the story of the first Pentecost mm -hmm. is really powerful as to how something actually happens. And what I got when I was doing my, my interpretation of the New Testament for, with evolutionary eyes is that the alternative to Armageddon is a planetary Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Really. But we were all be empowered from within to speak in our own voices. And so when Tony said, let's make a symphony, That's a trip. I thought you could do something with the, with the music 
and art, mm -hmm. which is not only about intellectual communication, mm -hmm. probably many fewer words. And I got um, the realization that the whole story of creation is an art form. Mm -hmm. And we talk about creator, well, God creates, it's an art form. The entire, from the origin of creation all the way on up to the planetary Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And we're not alone in the universe, folks. What about that? <laughs> if you want to talk about a new beginning, there we are. Anybody have anything to say on that? <laughs> Daryl, how about you? Sure. <laughs> well, music is a, music is the language that crosses all sorts of borders, right? And, and it may cross dimensions as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a carrier of intention. Sound healing is the capacity of putting healings, healing intention into sound and putting it through. So uh, at Pentecost, that is a, a, a result of a symphony. Sounds perfectly normal um, <laughs> to me anyway. Um, but I did want to talk just a little bit. I've been hearing the whole education thing. and. Um, you know, we, we kind of make this assumption that our school system was set up to help uh, our children grow and evolve. <laughs> and you know, it just wasn't that way. Uh, the school system is set up to sort, to sort children. And that's, that's its function. It's how you measure is how you decide what your goal, you know. What your goal is and how you measure have to be together. And right now, our system of measuring in schools does not support any sort of uh, emotional love connection, soul to soul. It just doesn't. So you have to do what Joan said and you have to create from outside. You have to create an alternative system. This system is, is dead. Okay, so my kids are in this system, but luckily school is not the only place where children learn. Right? So they learn much more around me and my friends and like that, so we, we're, we're lucky there, but we have to create from outside. I'm, I'm helping create a system for healthcare outside of the normal system. We're creating a medical free city down in Belize um, where we can do things that we can't do up here. And that's the sort of, sort of thing that people have to do. They have to homeschool, they have to create their own things outside because the system is not going to allow you in. It just simply, it's been proven time and time again. Right? It wasn't intended for your children to evolve, mm -hmm. right? It just mm -hmm. never was. Um, I just want to go back to a reference I think you made, Barbara, that I believe there's thousands upon thousands of underground evolutionaries. And yes. I think part of it that's occurring is, yes, there's people that are finding the connections to humanity's team. But there's thousands that don't have a place that they see yet. And um, so in that, when you feel alone and lonely in these structures, I think you used the word impotent. impotent. Mm -hmm. What I see is many people then just shutting that impulse down mm -hmm. and saying, well, to live in this world, I've got to do this because I don't see the good news. So I think there's, there's mechanisms occurring, but we can't do enough of it. There's so much bad news. There's so much people can turn on and see the systems that are there now. But that good news, you know, for me, it's that when we wake up, what station can people tune into? And we need more and more alternatives to be able to turn something on and feel connected to something bigger and evolutionary. Mm -hmm. And I see it very strongly in our young people. You know, I see it time and time again, the kids that come out of the school system, they didn't fit in, they come out, and they don't know where to connect. No, that's right. They're, they're like, okay, so now, what do I, how, how do I, you asked an interesting question is, why aren't we doing it? Because many people don't see a source of how to thrive in this world and do this evolutionary thing. 
So, you know, whatever, what's a 20 year old looking at? Okay, I can go to a university that's more credentialed, then I get a job because still we're working, we got an old system and new ideas happening. So, I just wanted to really um, emphasize the importance of creating those containers, places for more people to have a voice too. I still kind of see, even in our spiritual communities, kind of more a top down versus a rising up of voices and a place and a platform for them to express. I'm not missing. I don't meditate enough, I'm not running enough, I'm not, I, oh my gosh, I gotta go to this class and that class. In the meantime, something is being miscalled. You know what, you've got it and you've got an incredible voice and you have an impulse and economically, that's where I always get stuck is, wow, we're in a system, how, how do we create places? You know, what? I'm, I'm very familiar with Rachel's work it wasn't big changes that teachers needed to make with the 150 students. It is understanding a context in which to hold your classroom and you can teach chemistry or physics or AP history in a context where someone feels they have a place that's safe enough for their voice to be heard. And I have a kid right in the public system in high school and there's teachers where she'll say, no way. It's intimidating, I can't say it. And you know, I'm gonna get marked off, I'm gonna get 50 per, and there's teachers that she goes, wow, I love, I don't love the subject maybe, but I'm staying with it because this teacher's great. Yeah. I feel connected. So yeah. I just wanna say that those contexts, we have to look, you know, because I, I observe a lot and look at structures and I've observed that in the spiritual community, people feel, little they feel they're not enough and so where do they go with that it's this searching and we're in a different connection I think even in that world it's not about oh I'm gonna go find my peace inside I need that connection of co-creation and then people wake up and boy does the genius shine from that place so that's what I'd love to see is more context for people to be able to come to and feel part of. We have two hands back here. This one first. In my day, <laughs> <laughs> that thought came to me. What a great new age. What a great new age. I can't, I, I'm so excited. Uh, it makes me the cleft. Um, you want to say your name? I'm, I'm Peggy Carpenter. Um, I'm so excited because this is not a revolution. It's an evolution. Please keep that in mind. We're not changing. In, the, what's change, what needs to change is the inside. From the inside out, not the outside. This is not a competition, my dear. You don't need to take 10 classes to obtain a good heart. You have to, that has to come from the inside. You have to, I, it's my journey that has helped me to recognize why we're all here and why I'm so excited is because we're all, we have come together collectively so that everyone can, can contribute from their heart to the planet that they chose to come to to make us recognize that there's nothing that needs to be fixed. There's nothing broken. We're all one. We're all together in this planet to learn who we are and who we are is all one collective consciousness or mind that can live in peace, that can live in oneness and can live in awareness. And um, what a joy that planet will be when that's recognized. I do believe that in order to do that, there will be material things that will move because there are things broken and not so much broken, but have not evolved to the level of awareness. Thank you, and, and who raised their mm -hmm. hand on this side? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, uh, Ron. 
Uh, let me affirm what I, I just... Say your name. I Ron Billingsley. Let me affirm what I just heard and repeat what I've heard repeated over and over again. Uh, the, the word context. I'm laughing because somebody mentioned the S training and one of the, uh, the key phrases from the S training is that context, the frame, mm -hmm. chews up content, the activity yeah. that's mm -hmm. taking place. And, what, and again, uh, what is extraordinarily powerful and usable is that content, a uh, context, the framework, is something that we can do individually. Each one of us provides a context with every human being that we encounter. Yeah. And we can also do it as a group. Mm -hmm. So this possibility of creating continually a context uh, which is transformative is something that we have available all the time, both as individual and, and as members of groups. I'm also laughing because I'm realizing how old I am. And there Hi. was many years ago a man by the name of Stuart Brand Stuart Brand wanted to publish the whole Earth catalog and he was oh, yes. bugging sure. the science uh, space people to come out with a picture of the whole Earth, of the whole Earth. And finally, the NASA people provided us with that image. And that image uh, was transformative. It certainly was transformative for the poet Archibald McGlish, who wrote a beautiful poem about it. But uh, it was also transformative in the sense that we finally had an icon, a visual entity that reminded us, as Joseph Campbell says, that there's going to be a new myth, a new vision. It's going to be one people, one planet, one unity, and speaking of evolution, the evolutionary strategies which facilitated individual group and individual group protection and it worked beautifully for thousands and billions of years are now going to have to be enlarged to include a single group, which is a planetary group. And, and so that's the context that you folks keep referring to in the Hindu tradition, the expression is ikam sat, mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. one exists. Mm -hmm. So our movement, which is, I think, articulated in a variety of ways by this group uh, toward that sense of oneness and, and we see in practical terms in the development of general systems theory, von Bertolanffy's ideas and so on and so forth. Uh, if I am sitting enjoying a good meal and all of a sudden uh, a tiger comes up and threatens me, the stomach doesn't say, hey, that's my blood down here. <laughs> I need the blood on the legs so I can move because I'm an organ, I'm, an, I'm a, a single system. So this is an mm -hmm. awareness of our unity, our, our part participating in a, in a unitary process that we're all moving toward and can contribute to. And it's ex extremely exciting to be in this group because clearly that image, that whole earth image, that singularity is something that you're all carrying. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, I just want to thank you for, for highlighting, shining a light on the context uh, because the other day in one of the wonderful lunches we've had here with Barbara, informal lunches, there was a gentleman, and please raise your hand if you're here, who uh, told us about something that is working, and it's a new school in, yeah, in um, Aurora. And he, when he was sharing with us about this new school, I asked him, what is the consciousness behind this school that really is supporting these children? And he said one word, love. Mm -hmm. So that's the context for this school. It's what everybody from the janitors to the teachers to the principals work from. And so, you know, it could be pretty simple. And that's all I want to say. This woman had her hand up to Hello. My name is Bernice. I wanted to respond to the notion of the context because we really have entered an age now where the context means that we're not alone. Yes. And I really wanted to support Barbara's mm -hmm. and what she said this week about that. Lots of people know that we are not alone, but we're in a ring pass knot culturally. So people that would you think normally would be curious about it uh, aren't turning to the data. And there's very fine data there from the military in particular, uh, Robert Dean, Robert Salas, and so on. The data is there if you look. So what that context does is it puts new types of pressure and challenge on our psyche. One of the stories of the visitors uh, that happens when the visitors visit sometimes, uh, 
there are many different types of visitors, of course, but they say that the place they visit becomes totally quiet. Mm -hmm. There's such a sense of peacefulness there. Uh, everybody comes into a, a place of common, great calmness. How does that happen? You know, One of the things the visitors have said is, your religions have done you a lot of good in building community when we first started. But the religions and the institutions are focusing on the lamp. It's time now you focus on the light, because it's the light and the vibration and the coming of the cosmic fire mm -hmm. that is really the inspiration. Mm -hmm. So that is the context. Mm -hmm. And now we need to find out what the, what the new content will be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I, having experience as an expeditionary learning teacher, taking kids on real life trips so that they apply what they're learning in the classroom to real life, I, I just have a few things, because you're talking about what, what, what is this education for the new evolution going to be like? And so just a few notes. Love, yes, I mentioned that once in a teacher meeting. Oh my gosh. You, you would think that I had said something pornographic or something. <laughs> you know? we, don't, we can't use that word. I mean, there, there's such a, a, a recoiling from whatever that word is and what it means. Oh my gosh. And, and any more to hug a child, uh, look out, you got to have a lawyer. So, I mean, what is going on with our humanism? That, I'm obviously coming from this whole attachment kind of point of view. But the other is... The difference with children and watching them is going from the theor theoretical to the actual. We can sit in our chairs all day long and blah, blah, blah. But until we get up and we build the blocks together and we knock over that or we bake the cake, who cares? I mean, really. And that's where we lose kids. We're losing kids in the blah, 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 sitting there thinking about being theoretical instead of being actual with our learning. Because it's not relational. It's just somewhere in the ethers, right? Until you start doing it and you're affecting somebody else's life by handing them a muffin you made or, or a, a little car that you built or something like this. And the last thing is play. If this evolution doesn't have play, I'm not sure I want to be part of this evolution, right? If, you're, if I can't dance in your revolution, I don't want to be part of it. And, <laughs> and it's really true that that's where we lose children. When, when they are playing, they are learning. They are evolving. They are being in. Uh, they are. They are creating. And when it turns into work, about age eight, that's where they shut off, and we all start going rogue. So, how can we make evolution as playful as possible? Mm -hmm. Where is the joy? I love the peace, great, but give me a little joy along the way, <laughs> and I'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> so I'd like to um, introduce another treasure that's a, a recent friend of yours who's here with us, and that's Kevin Townley. And Kevin has a, well, he was at the club a few weeks ago. He teaches our uh, Western mysticism. Mm -hmm. or, uh, well, I wouldn't say teach. He fosters a conversation about Western mysticism for us and has a very interesting, I, at least for me, an, an evolutionary perspective of how this all lines up astrologically and, and where this is coming from and going to and the kind of a place we're all in. And so, Kevin, would you, would you enlighten us a little about that? Yeah, well, I was going to say a few things. We'll see about it. Or stand up. I can't stand I'll just stand up. I'll just stand here. That's okay? All right. Thank you. So um, just as an observer over the past several, maybe 12,000 years, <laughs> noticed that um, all, of the, all of the world religions have taken on the form of the astronomical context in which our solar system had entered. So I'm going to take you back about 12,000 years into the age of Leo, and the deity of the time was Sakhmet, which is the great lioness goddess. Yes. Uh, and uh, so we have a sphinx out there that kind of represents that. And then we move into the age of, uh, of Cancer, and we find these really big, chubby, maternal figures in the, in the matriarchal ages. This was a period, a cycle. Matriarchy, patriarchy, matriarchy, patriarchy. It continues. And so then we move into the age of Gemini, and we have all the myths around the twins, you know, the Sumerian twins and so on, and they were the god forms at that time. And then we move into the age of Taurus, and so we have the sacred cow of, of uh, okay. India, we have the Mithric cults and all these things, and that were, they became the, uh, 
religious symbols right. of that time. And then we move into the age of Aries, and we have the Hebrew dispensation, and we have the ram, beginning with Abraham or Abram, uh, you know, sacrificing the ram instead of his son Yitzhak. And that age continued, and the ram became a really prominent figure in our religious understandings. And then all of a sudden we come into the age of the fish. So we see them on bag of cards, whether it says Darwin or Rickthos or whatever, the fish is a prominent figure, not only in our religious orientation, but even in our, in our architecture. The Gothic architecture is totally ridden with fish-type symbolisms. The Vesica Pisces, the great Gothic cathedrals are all representations of this type of uh, Piscean, two circles, passing through the center of each other, create a vesica Pisces, and they are the blendings of worlds. And so we see that. We're now entering into another area where our whole solar system is moving into what we call the Aquarian Age. And it doesn't happen when the moon is in the seventh house of Jupiter or <laughs> Mars, because that happens pretty frequently, actually. <laughs> okay? So um, here we are. There's an opportunity. So just as we generally begin to look at the... Uh, the, the planting season when the sun goes into the, equino the equinox in the springtime. Uh, we know that spring is coming, there's equal day, equal night. Then the sun moves in, in, to the its highest point in the sign of Cancer, at least tropically, and so on and so forth. There are seasons that tell us this is the season and this is what we do during this season. Well, the seasons have larger contexts. Contexts that last one year, contexts that last 25,000 years context of the last 2,160 years. We might even find out that one of those contexts create what we would call global warming or a huge summertime uh, on the planet. It's happened thousands and thousands of times before. It's going to happen thousands and thousands of times again. We are in that. We might help accelerate the process a little bit, but nonetheless, uh, these are seasons. And we are now into a season, an Aquarian season of 25,000 years, but it's simultaneously occurring with the Aquarian age of 2,160 years and simultaneously occurring with one of 250 million years. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like have this constructive interference where the wave that would otherwise be like this has a series of building of these Aquarian waves that are now happening simultaneously. The water bearer um, is, is the image, the divine image, if you will, for the Aquarian age. Mm -hmm. And the water bearer does not carry water for himself, but he carries water for humanity. Mm -hmm. And so this is what <clears throat> we are, pouring forth the lives of the life, blood of waters for thirsty humanity. And so having looked at this situation, while we want to see what works, we also want to find out and uh, where the resistance is from having it work elsewhere. And so that generally has all of this falling back to ourselves. What is the sense of an Aquarian age mean to us? What is the sense of a familyhood of humanity? We can talk about oneness, we can talk about the familyhood, but you know, I'm, I'm family with this group here, but not so much down the road there, because I'm not <laughs> feeling so hot about those group, that group of people. Uh, so I would say that there is a certain requirement incumbent on each and every one of us to examine where am I resistant in not only talking about the, the fact of the oneness, but experiencing the oneness. There's a whole difference between saying we're one and feeling that, that peace about being one. And so where's the resistance? Is it in our political ideologies? A lot of times our religious ideologies get away, even a little bit. So that you can name it. You can go around the wheel of the uh, evolutionary wheel and pick each and every one of those subjects and find out where we, where we are with that and where is our resistance and where is our flow with that. Where is our yes and where is our <coughs> I'm not going to do that, no way. So th this, this um, opportunity, this Aquarian age, which is now only about 75 to 100 years away, um, but the, the Vesica Pisces, where the two circles pass through the center of each other, it's like th we're in a place where it's not daytime and it's not nighttime. It's the dawning. It's not either one. From the age of enlightenment to about the present time, we are beginning to feel the impact. And the Hindus also talk about the same idea with the... Uh, the end of the of the descending and ascending Kali Yuga, we are now officially in what is called the Dwarpa Yuga, which is about knowledge and being able to take that information and apply it with with wisdom and with love. So this is this is what's upon us. So each and every one of us have to do a very strict examination of ourselves relative to our resistances and also what we're willing to do and then follow through with that. And and uh, we're responsible. It's not going to. No one else is going to do it. 
So if we have the capacity to a really good evaluation of ourselves, and then also um, be open to the differences and the similarities of the world religions, the political ideologies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna find ourselves lining up with that much more easier than if we simply kind of have our own little circle that's insulated from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful to that. There is, there's, a, there's a tendency towards being insular. Mm -hmm. We're on the evolutionary team and they're not, that kind of thing. <laughs> so there, there's that evolutionary uh, piece that, that the, begins to show the, or cast a light on the responsibility that each and every one of us has. Mm -hmm. and, and what are we as an individual going to do about it? And then we are better qualified to join together, you know, not just in a conversation, but in an active, in an active effort. So working on ourselves, bringing those worked on selves in concert with other worked on selves. Mm -hmm. And so that we can begin to really mm -hmm. feel this, uh, experience the reality of the oneness and, and not, and remove it from the world of platitudes into the world of of physical reality. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. like to recognize while we're in this space is that we're in this space yeah. <laughs> and that this started like everything else from no thing to something and that something for me began 10 years ago when I joined the City Club which I thought of when you were speaking because the City Club is a safe place for passionate and caring people, obviously we have a whole room full of them, this is the mission statement, mm -hmm. to, dis to uh, explore our differences, discover common ground, enrich our world, and have a good time <laughs> while doing it. <laughs> so a little microcosm, you know. And, um, and I'd like to invite Sina, if he would like to, to share his vision of the Highland Institute, which has been emerging in some form this summer, but has been a vision of Sina's for some years because we've been talking about it, but like, what is it? Would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give the speech that you gave. <laughs> <laughs> it was out of my mouth. <laughs> so that's it. I second whatever Kevin said. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what. Um, Highland Institute is. I just think it's a good idea to do something. So we have a name, uh, and we're all here, we're all hungry for it, we all want to do something, but this is a deja vu of what we tried 10 years ago, saying, hey, let's start a community. And it was funny, and do we need to wear saffron robes, and do we have this? They go, no, let's just build a community. And we didn't have a name, and we didn't have any structure and 10 years later we got something you know city club provides us with all of that so it's lovely to have a whole bunch of really smart interesting and enlightened people to say yeah we're all blind men touching this concept and trying to figure it out so i'm convinced that something will emerge and then each once in a while while we're talking amongst ourselves somebody like Barbara shows up and there's a whole bunch of energy like the past 10 days has been and we're one notch higher on that uh, spiral we go up you know I'm still not clear but I'm more clear than I was 10 days ago I think it has to evolve exactly what evolution is about exactly Exactly. And then, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, Roger shows up and says, hey, I got a logarithmic curve of human evolution going back 13.8 billion years. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that out. <laughs> and then I go, well, you know, it's a, you know, I got to eat lunch anyway. I'll go see what this is all about. And an hour and 14 to 45 minutes. This was also a two hour thing. You go, wow. I'm just a lot smarter than I was two hours ago. And then we've done a couple of these things. So all I know is that uh, human evolution is ongoing. It has a positive slope. It's got historical context of how it has happened in the past. We know that 2,500 years ago in Athens, something happened. We know that 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, something happened. We know that, you know, 
of Florence, Italy of 500 years ago or Philadelphia of 230 years ago, we have examples of this. So the question is, you know, if we all had a passport and some time and some money and wanted to go hang out where the action is, where would it be? Is it Aspen? Is it uh, in Davos, Switzerland? Where is it? And why wouldn't we just have a mini version of it ourselves? And if it becomes the big picture, great. If not, at least we had a good time and we're a node on that evolution that we all want to be a part of. Beautiful. Now I think we should all go home. <laughs> Can I say something? Yes. I, uh, this is Janet. Yeah, my name is Janet Gunn. And Barbara talks all the time. I've been a student of Barbara's for three years. If you just pass those around. Um, she talks all the time about mapping, tracking, and connecting mm. creative, innovative solutions to the problems that we have in each of the 12 sectors of the wheel. And I finally decided at the first of the year, prompted by Steve Farrell, that I had the skills to create a website that would enable us to see each other and all the good that's, that we're doing. And to also um, put up put up um, stuff about ourselves that would cause us to be attracted to or attract other people to be attracted to us so that we can find each other to either uh, to, to um, match needs and resources thank you <laughs> so that's what this website's about it's version one of Barbara's peace room and it is I know that there are greater marvelous pieces of software that eventually will come down that will be much, far more flexible and be able to portray this magnificence in a better way. But for now, it's a place to start. And it is, a, if people will come out there and join and put up, if you've got a seed of a thought, put it up there and see who you inspire and see who might want to come and help you um, develop that or if you've got a full-fledged project or a meeting or anything it's and and then tell me if you have problems with it in any place I have offered that from six to eight o'clock on every Friday night I'm available if anybody has um, is having a hard time navigating it I want to know how that why that is and how I can make it better so that we can um, make it a real tool for everybody so that as it gets popular, I mean, if you got there now, there's not a whole lot happening, but that's because I need people to come in and create things, and it's just the same evolution. You know, I'm not going to, I provided a basic structure. That's as much as I can do. I need co-creators, I need collaborators, I need people to uh, put data out there so that we can figure out how to make it even better. So that's Thank you. Thank you for that. really fun. First of all, thank you, Janet, for taking this on, because everybody wants it, but, but you're the one who's taking it on. It would be interesting to have a gathering with you here and have people actually put themselves on the map personally. Mm -hmm. In other words, we could have a circle and you put it in the internet, but you'd see each other doing it, mm -hmm. which would give you a sense of community in, with an internet function. And then maybe periodically, there'd be gatherings around the wheel. That's kind of a dream of mine, is that people would like to gather around the wheel and see what's going on and continue to add to it. And maybe we could put a combination of internet and social gathering. I would be happy if you guys want to bring your laptops and uh, set up a time. I'd be more than happy to, to come and uh, facilitate that. I have my Surface tonight with me I could go back there on that table after the meetings over if anybody wants to come and kind of see it and uh, I can do a little quick demo whatever you'd like to have thank you Janet that's really a great contribution to, yes. to what this is going what this is and, and, and this site is actually promoted by um, humanities team Barbara and a association for global thought so it's a
combined mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And it, is it, does everyone have this little card? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to. I have more. I'd just like to say a little word about the wheel mm -hmm. because I love this wheel. So. And if you look at the diagram that you have here, obviously it starts in the mind of the cosmos, the mind of God. You go through the turns of the spiral, and that core of the spiral represents the impulse of creation, the divine intent, the consciousness force spirit in action and just one note is not there's not an agreed upon word for god in evolution mm -hmm. every time you say god you have to have several other words mm -hmm. and that's okay so i just use a string of words for god <laughs> and <laughs> so so god force whatever you want to call it is the spiral is, is that core now it comes through the hub of the wheel and i am suggesting that the hub of the wheel could be considered a new sacred space where we actually incarnate and share the impulse of creation. When we get inspired from within and share insights and that it may not be what we're already doing and you need to have a, a safe space to do that in. And it would really be interesting to use the wheel in a social context. And you can't see it here, but right around the hub is a circle called Communion of Pioneering Souls. And that would be for us to take a moment, even right now, to be together in the hub of the wheel, feeling the impulse of evolution going through each one of us, being shared here in a field of resonance, and then put our minds together and activate the communion of those beyond us everywhere in the world. Our friends, their friends, the friends of friends, the people who are attracted, the people we've never heard of, who have the impulse within them connected in communion. We're not doing this alone. And that would be the, the beginning of a planetary Pentecost experience by doing that. And then if you see the next ring around there is called planetary DNA. <coughs> and that sort of goes along with what you're talking about, Gordon, is what is the organizational structure of the new culture? It does have some, it has it, or everything has an organic structure. And how does the structure of co-creation manifest? And what do we know about that? And I see here the people like yourself and Dwayne Elgin who are really working at how does the universe evolve a new culture. We're cosmogenesis in formation right here on Earth. So that's that. And then there's a ring called Golden Innovations That Work. So that is in every sector of the wheel, the identification of innovations and innovators. And that's what we did at um, the Global Wonders Day is every sector of the wheel was an, had an innovator speaking to the world from that place. Mm -hmm. And we collected the memes mm -hmm. that that innovator was part of. Mm -hmm. And you begin to get a mimetic code of the emerging culture from a collection of memes in every sector that comes from the people who are creating it. That's how we get it. So if you could imagine every sector being filled with the memes and the people already doing it, connecting with each other we would begin to get a feel, actually, of the emerging world. And it's always been my thought that the emerging world is in our midst, but it's not visible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all in separate parts, and it's not on the news, it's not in politics, and it's not in the universities. You cannot go to a university and study the whole system shift. Mm -hmm. You get more and more specialized the higher you go in, the, in it. So I, I'm just thinking, and there at the very, very growing edge, would be the noosphere getting its collective eyes until you could get the feeling of that quantum shift that goes way beyond individuals. So I, I think it might be interesting, Janet, to see if people would like at some point, whether it be a luncheon or an evening like this, to gather around the wheel like the hearth, like a fire. Mm -hmm. See the hub of the wheel as a, as a gathering around the fire, mm -hmm. as people did for ancient times and then people telling their stories, but then you put it in the wheel so people are not only doing it alone, but doing it together. Actually, to 
were king sized bed sheets and cut pie shapes out of them <laughs> and sewed them together and had a friend come over, she sewed them up for me. I dyed them all the different colors and made a big wheel of co-creation that you can actually step into. So we can bring that. <laughs> I mean, it could be a symbol for the gatherings to people then step into the place of the wheel. And there's a really very sensible statement Jonas Salk made to me. It's not survival of the fittest, but survival of what fits best. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to know where, what their, where their gift fits, where somebody needs it. And there's no greater joy than if somebody needs what you're yearning to give. Because otherwise you can give it into a field and it doesn't get the response. Mm -hmm. yeah. So part of it would be to see where everybody fits best, mm -hmm. meaning where their gift is most needed. Mm -hmm. And then you get the love and then you get the interaction and you get the joy. Mm -hmm. Supr Supra-sex. <laughs> Do you know my thought about supra-sex? <laughs> it's so funny, I was at Roger Teal's Mile High Church the other day and I was talking to this group and I was I thought I was doing fairly well. So <laughs> Roger stopped the whole thing and he said, Barbara, you have not told him about Supra sex. I said, Roger, I didn't know that you were really wanting me to do that. But anyway, I there was a group there Sunday afternoon, you know. And uh, so Supra sex is a really powerful thought that as we have reached a population limit and we have to have chosen children, and we're not going to ever double that population again, the yearning to join your genes to have the baby is expanding to join your genius to give birth to your greater self and your greater work. Mm -hmm. And supra-sex is sex rising up into co-creativity, from procreation to co-creation. And as we live longer and longer lives and have fewer children, the passionate to passion to join, to co-create, I believe, will be the major energy that will <coughs> evolve the world. It will be love joined to create, just like it was to procreate. That was a big job. Huge. <laughs> but we did it, folks. <laughs> so we certainly should be able to do this. But it's, it's, it's a form of love. So, so I would say that the evenings around the wheel could be very supra-sexy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I might ask, how many are here for the first time? A number, okay, a number of you. Uh, Mary will have an email list outside if you want to sign and leave your name and uh, there's a column for checking if you want to be on Barbara's email or if you want to be on the Highland Institute uh, email or both uh, and we'll, we'll keep you informed as to what's, uh, you know, what's happening here. And I would like to add, if, you're very, if anyone is interested in the, uh, the Shift Network, I'd just like to mention, is one of the internet sites where these kinds of ideas are going out every day. And there are hundreds of teachers there, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people are learning from the Shift Network. There's another one called Evolving Wisdom. And I will be doing a course starting September 16th called Co-Creators Rising. And it's going to start out with a kind of Rian Eisler <coughs> understanding of how we shift from the dominator culture to the partnership culture. And then it's going to go into the co-creative feminine, co-creative masculine, co-creative coupling. And Marion and Glenn will be featured on the co-creative couples. As to how do they do it? It's not so easy. You know, and then we're going to go on up to the co-creative society and visions of contact beyond this planet, shared contact with those beyond us. And we're going to get people like Neil Donald Walsh and Nassim Harriman and uh, Gordon Davidson and Foster Gamble and, and Daryl Laham all talking about our experience of higher guidance and higher contact with beings beyond the planet. And that is going to be a seminal course and it's going to break some of the boundaries of uh, the ship network in the sense that we're going to go all the way. We're going to go all the way. So 
there is a flyer out there for a free call if you would like to, but anyway, anyone who would like to be part of it, I highly recommend the internet courses that are on the Shift Network and Evolving Wisdom because it's one of the best outreaches for education that we have. Thank you. Now, Barbara, we were talking today about uh, how nobody talks about sex. Of super sex. Super sex and, and how that evolves. And so, you want to say a little more? Well, about yes, you know, it. it about what we don't talk about? Well, no, that was more than about sex. It was, or even supra sex. It's the fact that we don't talk about contact with higher life. Mm -hmm. When I went to this, uh, con this big conference called uh, Contact in the Desert, there were 2,000 people in Joshua Tree uh, in Palm Springs, California, and there were all the experts in various forms of contact and studies of why we don't know about it, why the government won't disclose it, why there um, is the defense industry trying to get the high tech that these entities apparently have. And it's just widely known, but not acknowledged mm -hmm. as a reality. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to Glenn, it's, it's like sex was in the Victorian age, contact with higher life is right now. Because people think you're kooky or strange or what. <coughs> so as I was sitting there, a total novice in this field, I said to my friends, including Denise, is Denise here? Right here. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> I, I said, you know, what would happen this is not about the government, the media, the defense industry. This is about the people. We're all here, and I did this in the Rogers Church. I said, first of all, how many of you think we're alone? I'll ask you here. How many of you think we're alone in the universe? Nobody. That was true of Rogers Church. Nobody of the 450 people thought we were alone. Then the next thing was, how would you feel if the people gathered in small groups and small groups and simply asked for shared contact to co-create? Well, would you like that? Well, they cheered. <laughs> now, this is at the Mile High Church, and I've been warned, don't say these things because you'll be considered kooky too. Well, I've decided that shared contact is not kooky. It's crazy <coughs> not to say this. Did you want to say something, Daryl? Did you raise your hand? Please say something. <laughs> no, but I will say something. Um, uh, shared contact through small groups getting together and asking for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a concept. We've been doing it for a few years, a group that I'm involved with um, that sing. We have a choir and we uh, sing songs to uh, the Pleiadians and others and ask them to come back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll go out on the limb because you know, I, don't, I don't have any what limit? We're all on the same. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> so, for sure. I have a pretty good feeling that every single one of us is a GMO. We are genetically modified organisms. Okay. A number of years ago, somebody came down and uh, changed us from having 24 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes by fusing two together and creating a, a complete different genetic organism from other primates. The evidence for this is just so incredible. Mm -hmm. and, but the implications of it are beyond what our scientific system will allow. We just, it, it just cannot be that way because we're going back to uh, suddenly saying, these, mythical, these myth stories of Yahweh and the creation of the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. these really happened. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. And going out and having in, in the Bible where, where, the, where the, the sons of Adam go out and kill all the rest of the tribes. Well, that happened. There were 27 types of humanoids before Cro-Magnon. There was suddenly this evolutionary upswing and there was this new entity. So, for whatever it's worth, there's a lot of evidence out there that we aren't alone. And not only are we not alone, but we are mm -hmm. uh, the sons of and daughters of um, another civilization and that they will come back. And um, so we have, let me just show you something. <laughs> so I've got some CDs of our choir and in 2012 we had 928 people singing um, the songs to uh, make contact. We've done this four times now. Each, each choir is a different size, different people. But, uh, and the choir, the singing itself is something just quite joyous. What, where wonderful. is this happening here in Boulder? Is it? 
Uh, it's every year there's a workshop that comes through, um, and I don't want to. Right, you know, well, but you I can, can talk to people offline. Over. Just yeah, talk. yeah, um, but um, uh, you can sing, and, and it's fun. And if nothing else, it is mm -hmm. it is soulful toning. Mm -hmm. right, so I'll just pass some of these around. Yeah, I wonder what the name of it is. It's, um, the Lemurian Choir. Yeah, so we have the Lemurian Choir, the Compassion yeah. Choir yeah. Um, in yes. Cancun. The Lemurian Choir was in Maui. And the Compassion mm -hmm. Choir was in Cancun. The Celebration Choir was just last June, uh, a couple months ago in Shasta. In March, we're going to be at the Luru um, in uh, Ayers Rock. And, and we work with some people who channel entities that tell us that what we're doing is activating the magnetic grid and preparing the earth for contact. So we are going to Could you speak nodal a points. slower and louder when you said that? So what we are, we, so, uh, so we work with um, uh, a gentleman named Lee Carroll who, who uh, channels an entity called Kryon. Yes. And Lee uh, was the first one to talk about indigo children, these yeah. children who are coming in who have different evolutionary, who are at the next level of evolution and we call them autistic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've been given information and we sing these, we, we've channeled all of these tones and worked with them and they're quite beautiful and they um, are transformative and a lot of people have had wonderful experiences with them. But um, uh, I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think we could just allow that, uh, that's the, the realm that I was saying people don't, talk about and so I want to really thank you Daryl for the work you've done with this and the music and the beauty of what you're saying and opening up for us because this is where the people themselves are doing this we don't have to depend on media or others for a natural expression of, of this and love of life love of the universe and since I've been for 50 years telling the story of the birth of a universal humanity. Now, where did I get that idea from? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I will just end with this thought. As I was calling up my people to, on the course to speak, including yourself and Neil and, and, and um, Foster Gamble of the Th Thrive movie and Nassim Harriman, the physicist, they all said, we know this not only from a higher guidance, but from the inner contact that we're experiencing. And so when we receive guidance, when we receive impulses like I did to go tell the story of the birth, I'm beginning to see that it's not only out there that we get this, we're all guided from within. Mm -hmm. And when we are really tuned into our inner scripture, we already are in contact. That was, that's what seems to be the case. And I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. Mm. Mm. Is it true or not? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 So that part of uh, what, uh, for me, such these kinds of circles would be is sharing inner guidance, sharing higher guidance, sharing greater information, and being a safe space to explore yes. mm -hmm. what may not be yet public and why isn't it public? Because it's just the same thing with the public schools, because it might offend some power structure, <coughs> like our defense department. <laughs> you know, so this is a safe space for love, for creativity, and I just want to thank Sina and um, Marion and, and Glenn and everybody who has been so kind to me here that I'm really anxious to move to Boulder as soon as I can. Wow. And participate.